Um, so first thing I usually like to do is whenever I start um, a class that's going to be recorded and available later, I always make sure to mention that uh, today is December 7th, 2022. One of the things that I'm always battling is people asking me questions about um, old information on the internet. You know, it's great to have this content up there. It's great to have videos that have a lot of views, but, you know, uh, these programs get updated all the time. So I really want to have um, new and, and the latest information available and to also let people know that when you are watching any sort of a instructional video, be very mindful of the date. Um, if it's 10 years old, I guarantee things have changed. So that's one of the things I always try to do when we start off. Also, um, uh, just a brief introduction to me for those of you who don't know who I am. Um, obviously, my name is Eric Joseph. I am um, uh, work for a company. My day job is I work for Freestyle Photographic and Imaging Supplies. Um, I've been there now for over uh, 36 years. Uh, so I've got a very long history in the industry. Uh, freestyle has been around since uh, 1946. So we have a very long history in the industry as well. Um, we, uh, um, uh, if you know who we are, great. If you don't, just a quick introduction. We, uh, we're a mail order company. We ship all over the world. We also have a retail store in on Sunset Boulevard in, um, in Hollywood. And we, we're not a consumer electronics company. We focus on the products that people use to make prints. So we're um, really big in analog, the analog film world. We are the largest seller of black and white film paper and chemicals in the world. Uh, number one product category right now is um, color film. Didn't think I'd ever see that in my career. Surpassed black and white film even uh, during the pandemic. Uh, you know, people say there's a resurgence of film. I don't know. For us, it never went away. Back in the year 2000, when the industry zigged and kind of, you know, what we call dropped off the digital cliff, we zagged and focused on wet darkroom. Um, so it's never been, um, it never disappeared for us. But then uh, I'm going to say about 12 years later, um, I was known as the darkroom guy long before the digital guy. And um, so I started focusing my career on helping people achieve best practices in printing. Um, my The start of my journey of exploration uh, happened to be just trying to figure out how to answer the question for people, uh, what paper should I use? That was a really big thing. What, I mean, we've got, more paper available than ever before in the history of photography, more types of papers available. What do I use? So you see behind me, this is a real wall. It's not virtual. Um, I have color accurate lighting um, on track lighting. And these are just nine, uh, 18 Im images from my portfolio where I have literally made an individual print that I have matched to a specific paper taking into account unique personality and characteristics and have created a, a I, I have another class that I teach called the world of inkjet paper the print matters so um, my journey was taking an image and printing it on every paper we sold and um, or at least started off printing the same image on a variety of different papers and then eventually turned that into a larger conversation so I do teach that class via Zoom from time to time. Um, I try not to, I don't have it recorded anywhere because the information always changes. And I really want people to be there for that. Um, I also have traveled the country for the last 12 years performing that workshop for colleges and universities and trade shows and uh, nonprofit uh, photographic education organizations and photo clubs and such. So as we're opening up more in the world, I will be traveling around more and performing that workshop. Um, so if you're interested, um, I did. I have put my email address in um, the chat so mm -hmm. you can reach me. Um, and um, and we also, uh, Andrew reminded me earlier, we have a 
a service that we provide to our customers called an inkjet paper psychotherapy session, which I do all the time. And most people laugh when I say that. Um, I know Andrew Epstein has taken advantage and Jackie Rupp and maybe some others. I've done these for years. Um, and basically, uh, you'd sign up on our website. It costs ninety nine dollars, uh, and it's basically three hours worth of work for me. We spend and uh, you'll sign up. We spend an hour talking about what you might think you like in paper, uh, and what you don't like, and then you would send me a file. Uh, we would agree to eight papers to print that one file on. Uh, eight different papers, and I print them all with custom profiles, and we'll talk about that a bit later. And then we'll send you the prints back in the mail. Um, and then we have another follow-up conversation. We find that it's it's really, for me, the only way to help you answer that question. I could talk about papers all day long and tell you, just use this or use that, and you'll be happy. But the ability for you to be able to make that choice on your own, seeing the difference is important. So um, I want to start off with whenever I have a class, I always make it a point to say and to impress upon everybody that there is no such thing as a dumb question. Okay. Um, people will, I'll, I'll teach class all the time to raise their hand and go, I have a dumb question. Like, it's not a dumb question, right? Just because I know the answer and other people might know, it doesn't mean you know, it, right? So the, the dumb question is the one that you don't ask. So I like these sessions to be interactive. I don't have a script. I'm going to fly through this kind of by the seat of my pants. If you have questions along the way, um, you know, there's a little hand raisey thing. I will try to keep uh, an eye on it. Jason is here, so he'll be monitoring it as well. If you want to type a question in the chat, please do. Um, I don't like to just hear myself talk, and I'm really here for you. And so, so just be mindful. Um, you got a question, and it's in the moment. Please ask it, and I will stop, and I will, I will answer it for you. So we are here today, really, to talk about Epson print layout. This is one of the best kept secrets in the industry. Um, Epson has not done, I think, a super job at really promoting this program. And if you have an Epson printer, um, at least a modern Epson printer, uh, after the 3800, 3880 series, um, we're talking the Sure Color series P9, uh, P400, 700, 900, 600, 800, the new uh, large format, P7570, 9570. Uh, this program works with all of the newer model Epson printers, and it can be very much an easy button for printing. Uh, and I can tell you, because I have essentially uh, focused my entire career on helping people understand how to get the best print quality from their printers, printing isn't easy. And I think this tool does make it a bit easier. So um, I'm going to start sharing my screen here. Okay, so this is a website that Epson has devoted to Epson uh, print layout software. You could type in uh, Epson print layout, it'll find it, usually comes up in the uh, top of the web browser. Uh, in the in terms of the uh, you know the responses you get from the internet, um, it's available for Windows and for Mac. Um, this is just a page that kind of goes over um, the basic features of it, uh, and there is in fact an iOS version of it, which honestly I haven't used that much. I'm not big on printing from my iPhone or my iPad. I mean I printed it with a little bit. It's pretty full featured, but it still, I don't think, gives you the best print quality. And whenever I teach my classes, I want to really impress upon you the subtle details of choices that are going to give you the best print quality. So this is a, a nice landing page with an overview of the program. Um, when you uh, download and install the program, um, or you have your printer, first of all, never use the disk that comes with the printer 
to install software. It's always going to be old right out of the gate. Okay, so just take that disk and just throw it away. I always go to the manufacturer's website uh, to download the latest version of the software. So here I'm on um, uh, Epson's uh, support uh, download page for the driver for the new Epson P900, which I have here. It's right behind me. And then what you're going to do is you're going to uh, click on the version of the operating system that you're using. So I'm actually on Mac OS Ventura now, the, the latest one. And it all seems to work. Um, I think there's some bugs in the media installer, but I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. And then you push go, right? It seems like after Catalina, none of the websites are really detecting the version of the Mac OS. So with all the manufacturers, you kind of have to choose your version of your operating system. Uh, and then you have drivers here. I'm going to make this a little bigger so we can read it. Um, and download the driver utilities and combo package installer for this printer. Um, so it's going to download a, a package with a bunch of programs, including the driver and um, Epson print layout if you have one of these newer printers. I don't have a P800 anymore, and my sense is on the P800, which is the older model, the one prior to the P900, you're not gonna get um, Epson print layout in the package. You will have to go to a utilities uh, button here and download it separately. You also, and I'm trying to resolve this with Epson right now, you might not be able to get version 1.5.8, which is what we're going to be talking about today. You might be limited to 1.5.5. Like I said earlier, I work with a lot of people on helping them troubleshoot their issues. And I'm finding that on the P800, um, there's just no way to really get 1.5.8 loaded right now. And I have reported it to Epson and they're looking into it. So, you know, you push download and then you run the installer. I'm not going to do it now because that'll take up some time. But it's a standard installer. You, you know, you push continue, continue, agree, install, type in your password, et cetera. And then what's going to happen is at the end, you're going to, um, uh, it's going to install the driver. Now, um, for those of you who don't have Ventura yet, this is going to look a little weird to you. Um, our system preferences now is called system settings. They took out the word preferences, replaced settings. And now we have this very different looking system preferences page, but we still have printers and scanners here. And you can see that I have the actual driver loaded. Now, the reason why I say this is because um, if you, um, on some computers, uh, pre-Ventura and Monterey and such, what's been happening with drivers is kind of odd. It's been um, loading what we call an AirPrint driver. So if I click here, so you see it says P900 series. Uh, I found on uh, Catalina, Mojave, Big Sur, you add your printer, it's going to add another driver here. See if this will come up right. So see where it says air print here? You don't have, I'm, uh, Jim, nod. Nod, Jim. Can you nod? Can you see that? Air print? Okay, good. This is bad. This is very bad. Okay, air print is a dumbed down limited function driver that Apple has created to make it easy to print from your iPhone or your iPad. It also doesn't integrate with Epson print layout very well, and it doesn't give you a lot of the features you need to really get great print quality. So I, I get a lot of calls from people that the operating system has loaded this version of the driver by default and it's causing them problems with color and all sorts of things. So I really want to highlight the fact that this is happening and to avoid it. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to delete that driver, right? You're going to remove printer. And the way to load the correct version of the driver, um, at, which you see here is 11.01, is you click add print scanner. And, and while this looks different, admittedly, from maybe what you have, it's the same principle. What you really need to do is click on this. And then instead of leaving it, where, see where it says use, click select software, and then select a driver here and click OK. That will ensure that the correct driver is loaded. And again, I can't stress enough how big of a deal this is. And it's happening on Canon printers as well. And it's totally an Apple thing. So you click OK now, and it will add the driver just like is shown here without the AirPrint driver. So this is important. I just want to spend a few minutes on it because it'll save you a lot of problems in the future. OK, so. Um, Let's get out of this website here. And again, um, if you have issues or difficulties, um, you've got my email address. That's what I'm here for. I, I answer questions for people all the time. Um, so let's start working with Epson Print Layout a little bit. So um, I have it here in my doc, see? Um, and Epson Print Layout can be um, started up as a standalone application. It can also be used as a plugin for Photoshop, and you can also export to it from Lightroom a couple of different ways. So I'm just going to do it kind of simple to begin with. Um, if you don't have it in your dock like I have it here, it will reside on an Apple computer in your applications folder. Uh, on a Windows machine, it'll be in your programs folder, and um, it'll be in uh, a folder called Epson or Epson software. And as you can see, it's right here. And to get in my dock, I've just dragged it down in there. So I'm going to double click on it. And as you can see, I'm opening it up as a standalone application. I've also reset the program to its factory default. So when you get it, when you open it up for the first time, it will look just like this. And um, essentially, uh, this is really how I use it. Um, I don't use it as a plugin as much because I like the flexibility of being able to just drag and drop files in here. So I have an image of my very famous golden pavilion and I'm just gonna drag and drop it in there. And there it is. So the first thing I want to point out is that one of the nice things about this program is that when you have a horizontal image, it brings it in as a horizontal preview. Even though the print paper is going to go in vertically, it still brings it out in nicely as horizontal. Um, and the first thing I do is I bring this little bar up. This bar shows me the preview of that file. Okay. So let's say now I want to bring in another image into Epson Print Layout. I can take another image and drag and drop it right into my preview. So now I have two images in there. If I want to have a third image, I can drag and drop it in here as well. Okay. So, so now I have three images in here. So I can go print and go to the next one and click print and go to the next one and push print if I wanted to. Um, so this is your preview screen. Notice down here in the lower left where it has the size of the paper, uh, the size of your, and it has the PPI resolution of your uh, file, right? So the best file format for printing on these, what we call pigment-based uh, inkjet printers is you want to have a file where the color space is set to Adobe RGB 1998. You want to have it as a, uh, uh, as a flattened TIFF file, right? No layers, flatten it, save it as a TIFF file. Um, if it was originally a raw file, it should be maintain a 16-bit 16 uh, 16 depth. 
Um, and on an Epson printer, the best PPI resolution, notice it says PPI, pixels per inch. That's what it is on your computer. If you're formatting your file, you're exporting it out of Lightroom or you're formatting in Photoshop, it's pixels per inch, not DPI. DPI is when the ink hits the paper. So your printer prints DPI, but the file is formatted as PPI, pixels per inch rather than dots. And the reason why 360 is the best is because you want a number that's easily divide, divided into the native resolution of the printer. Epson printers are 2880 by 1440, half of 1440, 720, half of 720, 360. So there's a lot of opinions out there about this. Typically speaking, if you're making your image smaller, it's not going to be a big deal. But if you're making it bigger, then the pixel density is going to decrease and you're going to see your image quality go down. So right now you see over here, I've chosen my printer. Um, the printer, by the way, if I had a P700, had other printers here, they would show up here and I could choose them and print from this interface without leaving it. Um, I'm going to print on Epson Ultra Premium Photo Paper Luster. So you have your media type settings here. These are super important. One of the critical points of failure in, that I find that people make in terms of mistakes is choosing the wrong media setting for the paper that they're using. So if you're printing on any sort of a paper, it has a gloss or a shininess to it, that paper um, has a coating on it uh, that's an inkjet receiving coating called microporous, and it requires a media setting that uses the photo black ink. These media settings give mechanical instructions to the printer on how much ink to squirt on the paper, whether to use photo black or matte black, it might also force you to use one of the certain feeding mechanisms on it. There's all of these mechanical instructions that go into these. So I am actually going to be printing on Epson Ultra Premium Photo Paper Luster. Epson has obviously provided you with media settings that are the name of their papers so that you know, kind of just by looking at the box, what to choose. But I'm going to tell you that most of the manufacturers, and I have standardized, right? Standardized. So if you're using a Canson or a Hanamule or a Moab brand semi-gloss paper, just use ultra premium photo paper luster. That is photo black, print head heights at a certain level, da da da. It's a good standard all-purpose media setting for all glossier luster uh, inkjet papers. Now, if you're going to print on a fine art matte paper, right, um, velvet fine art is the media setting that all the manufacturers have really um, standardized for. So, um, uh, and a matte paper is one that has no reflectivity. It feels different. It does not have the same coating on it. So velvet fine art paper uses a matte black ink with a very large ink load. Now, if you're printing on an inexpensive matte paper or like a plain paper, we have plain paper as a media setting here. Um, we also have ultra premium presentation matte paper. So this is a lighter ink load, still a matte paper. So I will use that sometimes on, we have a brand of paper from Japan called Awagami. And, um, Awagami has sometimes they have really, really thin papers. If you use velvet fine art, it's too much ink, and the paper will come out really wavy because there's just too much ink load. So those are really kind of my, you know, three standard media settings. If you're using an Epson paper and you're using hot press natural, choose hot press natural. It's easier that way. But I'm going to also tell you that Velvet Fine Art is the, basically the same as, as Hot Press Natural. So for, you know, we're starting off here. I have Ultra Premium Photo Paper Luster in the, in the printer. 
I'm going to choose that media setting. The paper size by default is set for A4. Um, when you click on this, you're going to see a number of different standard media, uh, sorry, paper sizes here. The A sizes, for those of you who don't know, are all European uh, and Asian letter sizes. These are the sizes that everybody else in the world uses, except for us. We're the only country that uses U.S. letter, U.S. legal, 1117, 13 by 19, and 17 by 22, and 4 by 6 and 5 by 6. These are all our sizes. The rest of the world uses these other sizes. So A4, as you can see down the lower left, is 8.27 by 11.69 inches. So it's a little skinnier. It's a little taller. If we go to U.S. letter, you'll now see that the size down here changes to 8.5 by 11, right? So, um, and then, of course, we have um, 1117. And it'll adjust the preview for the size paper that you're using, and then certainly 13 by 19 and 1722. So we're going to put it back on U.S. letter for right now. Um, don't worry, we're going to move that around. Right now, it's not set to center. Um, paper source. So we have various paper sources to choose from. The standard one, if you just want to print from the top, is just sheet, right? Um, the printer will do borderless printing. Um, but only on certain sheet sizes. And in order to get it to print borderless, you have to go in here to detail settings and uh, click expansion and scale to fit. And then you see that it's now printing borderless. So that's how you print borderless. By the way, I'm not a big fan of borderless printing. Uses more ink, crops your image. Ink's got to spit off the sides of the... Uh, paper, there's a, a box that comes with these printers now. It's called a maintenance box. Um, when the ink comes off the sides of the paper, when it does its nozzle checks and head cleanings, um, ink's going to fill up that box more quickly. So this is, you know, kind of the printing that we were used to when we would get mini lab prints. Um, I'm much more of a fan of printing with a border. So, and as you can see, it's doing some scaling in here. Um, and I'm going to want to really print this at 100%. And I'll show you why. Um, so, uh, also, you've got a front thick uh, uh, on this printer. There is a front fine art tray, uh, just like you had in the P800. But the nice thing about the new printers, these new P700 and 900s, is that... Um, you can feed everything from the top now. You don't have to use the front fine art tray. So your old P600, P800, if you chose a velvet fine art paper as your media setting, it would force you to feed from the front tray. And that tray is really not easy to use. So Epson really built these newer printers around the objections people had of um, the uh, P800 and P600. So um, they're allowing you now on almost any of these media settings to just feed in the top of the uh, printer. Um, so I'm just going to uh, choose sheet. And then um, we have these quality settings. Um, when you're choosing ultra premium photo paper luster, you're going to get five choices. I've done, I've printed on all of them. High quality is fine. I have not seen a difference between printing high quality, max quality, or this other one that's called max quality carbon black. Just slows the printer down. I would say that if you have uh, files with really fine text, uh, you might want to go up to max quality just to sharpen up that text a little bit more. But for photographs, high quality is really plenty plenty of quality. And I, I tell people, look, when you get the printer, try it out. You know, try it on standard, try it on quality, try it on high quality. I, I found that high quality, there, there, there's, there, it's better than the other two lower ones, but the other ones, the higher ones don't give you a lot of benefit. And then there's this detailed settings 
uh, panel here that opens up. So this black enhanced overcoat, this is an interesting um, setting. It's the same thing as carbon black, actually. You see it gets checked by default. Um, and what it does is if you have a really high gloss paper, and by the way, it only works on a paper that's very high gloss. It will You will not see it on a luster paper. It has to be a high gloss paper. It basically puts down another layer of light black and really juices up the blacks. It also takes a long time to print. I'm not a big fan of that setting. Not a big fan of it. I don't think it's necessary. I don't know many of my customers who print on really high gloss paper. Um, smooth gloss, uh, sm gloss smoothing. I've printed with that as well. I don't see a big difference. It's supposed to kind of knock down the reflectivity of some of the blacks. I don't think it's anything anybody in this group is going to use. So I would avoid um, trying to use that setting. I think it only gets activated. Um, well, actually, oh, so it's going to probably with photo paper. See, it only gets activated with photo paper glossy settings. So you can see how some of the instructions are baked into these media settings. So it's not even going to let, let you use it on the luster setting. But when you but you saw that it does kind of default to max quality. So put it on high quality as a setting. Click off black enhance overcoat. So this setting here, bottom edge print quality priority, if that your print comes down at the bottom, um, it looks a little fuzzy. You can check that. I've never had to um check that. Um Mm, I'd like to say I've spoken to the engineer that incorporated that choice in there. Not sure why they really have it other than maybe because as the paper's coming through and nothing's holding it down and it gets moved over a little bit, not sure what's going on there. Um, this is a button I do check though. And the reason is that um, everything that we set here will override the settings that are on the printer. So when you get your printer, you notice that you can choose the paper size and the media setting and all that stuff. If you ch click this button here, that means that Epson print layout will in fact override the settings that are on your printer. So you don't really have to choose the settings on the printer, okay? So I just leave it on whatever all the time and just print using the settings in Epson print layout. So um, we have some layout settings now. Um, and as you, you know, I mentioned earlier, a lot of this stuff is collapsed in the beginning. We're uncollapsing it so you can get to it. So be mindful of these little triangles here. Um, we're on standard. Um, there's template, right? I use this quite a bit when I do my inkjet paper psychotherapy sessions because I can put two images on a page very easily. Uh, there's also three up. Now we could do one, two, three, kind of crop them though. Um, and then there's four up, and then you can also uh, create your own templates. So you can go to edit template and you can click plus and you can you know, put rows and columns and um, do, you know, some templates on the, you know, on the fly here, but you have to set them up. You can't, once they're set up, they're static, and then you could just add new ones. So this is kind of an interesting little area for doing multiple images on a page. And then you could do panorama, which is you load the image in there and um, both the P700 and P900 can accept roles. So this is where you could print on a roll and or in a large sheet and, you know, it'll, um, you drag and drop the image in there and it'll just print out the, for the length of your panorama. Um, not one of the more popular choices, but um, it is there. And then there's gallery wraps as well. So if you're gonna do um, canvas wraps, uh, you see that it's mimicking, mirroring the image or you can, um, 
you know, make it a spe specific color on the border if you wanted to, that kind of thing. So your edges. So it's got a gallery wrap feature in there as well. Um, uh, centering. So right now I don't have it centered at all. I'm going to center it in there. And then you can see that my image is 10 by 6.67 and that I am printing at 100% because I'm at 360 PPI. Now, look what happens when I make it smaller. See how the PPI resolution changes? So now I'm at 508. And if I make it bigger, see how the PPI resolution decreases. I really like this little area down here because it shows me where I'm at. Now, the reason why I'm really kind of focused and I'm, I'm changing this back to 10 and just clicking over here so it locks in. Um, the reason why I'm focused on 360 PPI is this. Um, you can make it a little bigger and smaller all you want. That's fine. You're probably not going to see a big difference in print quality. But what I have found and I have repeatedly run into um, over the years is people that have problems printing, either mechanical issues with the paper not feeding or printing anomalies. Like I've had customers that have a thin white pencil line going through every image. And guess what? As soon as I change it to 360, it goes away. It's kind of a mechanical relationship with the printer. So um, I also like to do things robotically so that I can backtrack any problems that I have. So I really do focus on sizing my images at the right size that I want to print at 360 PPI on an Epson printer. For those of you who have Canon, 360 is not the right resolution. 300 is the right resolution, just as a, just as a note. And when I have these conversations on Canon, I tell people that. So while yes, Shrinking it, you know, 360 is kind of your minimum. Um, you know, this will print just fine. But let's say I went to 17 by 22. Okay. And I make the image bigger. Um, so now I'm at one, I can't read it, 166 PPI. Well, that's low resolution. Now my image is going to start falling apart. I'm going to start getting JPEG art artifacts. The image is going to start looking very soft. So I'm going to go back to US letter. And you know, people ask me all the time, how big can I make my file before it starts looking blurry or soft? And the answer is as big as you can make it until it starts making looking blurry and soft. That's why. Um, I say 16-bit file is better than an 8-bit file. You have more information. Um, if you're going to do like double or triple or up to six times, there is a program that I recommend for people to use called Topaz A uh, Gigapixel AI. Um, it generally goes for about $100. They've had, every time there's a holiday, they have sales. I have gotten just some astounding um results out of taking relatively small files running it through that helper application and and really saving a low resolution file and being able to make it bigger i am running into a number of customers who are uh you know using these ai programs like midjourney and those images come out very small they're really designed just for viewing on i um on a computer screen, they come out as PNG files. In fact, they're very small, very compressed, but we've been able to make really nice 17 inch square size images using Topaz. I mean, it really, really is a great program for that. So just be mindful of your resolution. Um, it does make a difference. Um, and then, um, you know, if you want to be my favorite customer, if you want to use up all your black ink, you can, you know, Print your margins in black if you'd like, um, or you can choose a color. It's kind of a fun feature here. Not that I do it a lot, but, um, and I do have customers actually to do print their margins in black because it does make the print look more vibrant. It makes it look, you know, the colors pop more on a black background. 
uh, but I generally would click that off. Uh, we're locking the image aspect ratio so that when I'm doing my changes and resizing and stuff, it's maintaining its aspect ratio. Otherwise, you know, it'll start, you know, doing some... It could start, you know, doing some crappy things here. So we don't want to, we don't want that kind of stuff to occur. Make that 10 again. And I'm just clicking in here to make that lock in. Okay. So we've gotten one, two, three quarters of the way through this. We're going to get down now to the last part of it, which is <clears throat> color management, color management. Now, this is one of my specific areas of expertise in addition to paper and helping, you know, when I shoot all of these images, I knew what paper I was going to print on. So my one of my areas of expertise is matching, you know, the image to a specific paper, taking into its unique personality and character, and then getting the best color out of uh, out of these printers. And we have another service where we create custom profiles for people. So right now you're going to have the manufacturer's generic profiles and they're good. They'll get you good enough for most people. That's fine, but there is better out there. And when we create custom profiles, we're increasing color gamut. In most instances, we're increasing shadow detail, maximum black, no two printers print exactly the same. This printer, P900, and my Pro 1000 here print very differently than the exact same printers that I have in the office. So generic profiles are designed to work on the sheer variation of the printers that are available. Custom profiles are made for your specific printer with a specific paper. So each profile is matched for a specific printer and paper. So uh, at the very uh, default, this says printer manages color. All this means is that if I've chosen ultra premium photo paper luster, the print driver is really just going to load the profile associated with that media setting, which is ultra premium photo paper luster. So the first thing I do is I take it off of printer manages color and I go to use ICC profile. So Printer manages color. If you printed just using the file and print command at a Photoshop, we've always had that, um, that choice. Well, then the other choice was Photoshop manages color. And I always hated that because it didn't really mean Photoshop was managing color. What it meant was you're using an ICC profile. So Epson recognized that and now calls it use ICC profile. And you see now where it says auto select, it's automatically loading the uh, the generic Epson profile for ultra premium photo paper luster. Well, if you had a custom profile like I do, and I've got, um, and unfortunately I will tell you this, it is, this uh, choice is showing you every profile in your system, including monitor profiles and reference profile, uh, reference color spaces and such. So be careful. If you choose Adobe RGB 1998 here, this is not a paper profile. This is a reference file that Photoshop and Lightroom use to create an Adobe RGB 1998 color space file. So, um, so there is a lot of stuff going on in your system here. Obviously, I've got profiles for Canon. Uh, these are Canson Infinity. These are all custom profiles that I've created for papers on the variety of printers that um, that we have, and you can see I've got I've got thousands of them. I mean, it's just like it's it's cumbersome to scroll through my list, and I'm not doing this to show off how many profiles I have. I just I have a lot of profiles. It's what I do for a living, right? So um, so you can leave it. You know, if you're printing on Epson Ultra Premium Photo Paper Luster. Put it on auto select and you'll see that it's it's now choosing that. But I have a, uh, a custom profile for this that I've created. So I'm going to go down to EJ. I'm going to go down to Epson um, Ultra Premium Photo Paper Luster or P900. So you see that leaving it on auto will automatically, uh, so, you know, uh, um, 
list the profile associated with the media setting that Epson set up, but uh, I also have my custom profile. So I've chosen it here, right? Now, uh, here's a little trick. This is something that they've included in here that I think is really nice. So um, here's your media type settings. Let's say I want to create my own, right? So I can go here and go to edit custom media, uh, click plus. I'm going to call this EJ Epson Luster. And you can choose your media setting here. And I can choose my custom profile now. Uh, come on, come on, come on. Sorry. Uh, Epson. There we go. Um, so now I click OK. That now comes down here at the bottom. And watch what happens when I choose mine and I do auto select it automatically lists the profile associated that I've just created. So you create a custom file. Um, now this is important for me. And honestly, I did reset the program to factory default before we started, which kind of messed me up because as you can see, I have a lot of profiles, right? So let's say I want to do one. Um, I want to do cans on platine. Well, instead of me going down here all the time and going, oh, here's a cans on platine. I can now go here, custom media. I know it's going to be that media setting, right? So I'm going to do plus and call this now Canson Platine. And then go here. I'll choose, that was my latest one. So now instead of cho choosing the separate this and then the profile, you'll see that it's loading the profile for Canson Platine. So this is a really nice feature of Epson Print Layout that certainly makes my life easier um, when I'm so I don't have to go search for profiles all the time. So I'm going to put it back here for Epson Luster. Um, then we're here at the bottom. This is it. It's the end. Home stretch. Rendering intent, very controversial selection here. Very misunderstood. Um, probably the thing I'm asked about, one, one of the top 10 questions, right, that I get. So what this selection does is it tells the print driver how to deal with out of gamut colors in relationship to the paper profile. So you have a paper profile. I don't know if you can see me. I'm sh sharing my screen. I'm probably a little, you know, a, a little square and a, a side. But profile is three dimensions. It's kind of like a blob. Um, in fact, you know what I can do? Um, here, I got Color Think Pro here. Um, show you what a profile is. So let's use. Um, Oh, I'm just going to use this as an example. Here's Ilford Smooth Pearl. That's what a profile looks like. That's a really well-formed, beautiful profile, right? And then I have a, um, I have a file. Let's use my, um, let's use my, where is my, uh, where is it? Golden Pavilion. Um, hold on one second. Uh, okay, let's see if this works. Okay, so um, so this colored area is the paper profile. I'm gonna make it a single color. I'm gonna make it, um, I'm just gonna make it black. So all these colors that are outside, oops, did the opposite. Make that true color and make that black. 
Okay. So the profile now is in black and the colors in my golden pavilion are outside of it, right? That means those colors are out of gamut. So what perceptual does is it takes these colors that are out of gamut and, you know, I'm, uh, I don't want these terms to be derogatory, right? It, um, but people will make them derogatory. It'll squeeze them. It'll take these colors and do a harder calculation and bring them into gamut for the paper profile. Relative color metric finds out where they are at the edge of this profile and just clips them out. So the result is a relative color metric, uh, if you choose it, can result in brighter colors, right? I've done a lot of testing with this. Uh, people that have really far out uh, 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 colors that are very out of gamut can result in, um, in bright being brighter. Perceptual generally renders them more normal in terms of appearance. So what I tell people is, look, um, use perceptual first. And if you're really not able to get your color right, try relative color metric. In most instances, you're not going to see a big difference. If everything was in gamut, you wouldn't see any difference, right? Because this selection is only giving instructions to the drivers how to deal with the out of gamut colors. Um, if there's nothing out of gamut, it doesn't matter. So I tell people try perceptual. 90% uh, of the people that I know of use perceptual. 10% uh, use color relative color metric. 99.5% of people have no idea why they use either. The correct answer is use which one looks better. Okay, that's the correct answer. Now, this choice black point compensation this does nothing in perceptual because as you remember when I just said a few minutes ago, it's bringing these colors that are out of gamut into gamut, right? So it takes care of it. Relative color metric because it's clipping them out. If you don't choose black point compensation, your, your blacks will be clipped and there'll be no detail in them. So most people check black point compensation all the time because um, it doesn't do anything perceptual. And if you choose to switch to relative, uh, you're going to have a problem. So I usually check it by default. Um, by me changing my media settings here, it switched back over to max quality carbon black. So I'm going to switch that back to high quality and click off black enhance overcoat. Now, I'm set here. I'm ready to go to make my first print. What I'm going to do is I'm I'm really happy with this selection here, everything that I have selected. So I'm going to go up here to where it says presets, and I'm going to do save preset. And I'm going to call this Epson Luster um, 8.5 by 11. So now what this just did was we added a preset and, you know, when somebody buys a printer from us um, and of course, you know, as much as I talked about analog photography earlier, you know, my kind of, my full-time job is working with people on this stuff. So, you know, for us in terms of the products that we offer there, it's basically focused on somebody who wants to make a print, whether it's darkroom or digital, right? So, so we sell printers, we sell ink, paper, very large selection of inkjet paper, uh, monitors. Um, I also teach classes in color management. So we talk about, you know, the proper monitors to use for editing images for still, you know, people that want to edit still images for printing, monitor calibration, uh, custom profiles, all that stuff. So I'm doing a lot of printing on different papers and such. So I now have a home base. And when I uh, usually will help somebody set some uh, printer up, we have a small fee where we're together for hours where I help you after you've purchased your printer, help you get it all set up. We do it remotely uh, via Zoom, gotten really good at it during the pandemic, set you up with a home base. So I've got this and go, well, okay, now I want to do Velvet Fine Art and I want to you know, I want a different size paper and I'm going to change the profile. Well, looks totally different now, right? And I'm, I might be confused. Well, now I have someplace I can go back to. 
So everything gets populated. So we have a little home base, just in case you get into trouble, you can go back to the standard paper that you're using. Um, now you did notice something that just happened, which I wanna point out, is this has a bit of what we call soft proofing built into the program. So you see, I have, um, you know, it's, there's the Epson, um, you know, my custom profile for uh, this luster paper. Um, and you see the image looks a certain way, but I see also, I just switched to Velvet Fine Art, which is loading the Velvet Fine Art media, uh, media setting and profile. And you notice that it got dulled down a little bit. And that's because matte papers don't have as much color gamut as glossy and luster papers do. If I switch this over to uh, washi, it's going to look even lighter. If I go to canvas, um, it looks different as well. Um, if I change this to relative, you see that sometimes you'll see a little bit of a change there. So there's a little soft proofing going on in here. Um, and what that means is it's applying the profile to the preview in the program. Um, you can do this in Lightroom and Photoshop, of course, as well. Um, to me, it's nice that they have it here, but I wouldn't be making any changes here, you know, making any permanent selections. Uh, well, you can't make any permanent selections to your, your image in terms of editing here. It all should be done in Photoshop and Lightroom anyway. And if you're gonna soft proof, I would do it there. Um, so I'm going to go back to my Epson Luster 8.5 by 11 preview here. So everything works properly. Uh, there is, um, actually, I should mention this too. Uh, there is a black and white mode. Um, not a big fan of it, to tell you the truth. Um, it is an easy way to print black and white. And you can make some adjustments here in terms of brightness, contrast, and tonality and, and um, tone. But I would rather make these changes in Photoshop and um, save my selections and print here with my custom profile. Because as you can see now, you have no profile control. You're just using the driver to print black and white. Um, and while it's called advanced, I really kind of call it the amateur black and white mode. This should all be done prior to getting to your printer programming program here, in my opinion. But if you like it and it works for you, I always tell people, my goal is to make you happy and make you comfortable with this process. Um, whatever works for you, do that, right? Um, so I'm going to push print. And you can see it's sending to print data. And I'm hooked up via a network here. And see the printer, I'm, I'm hearing it making noises. Um, I've got a few sheets of Epson... Uh, ultra premium photo paper luster in there, and it's going to start printing. Um, also here um, says ink low, click on my information. Um, uh, I do have four inks that are low in there. Um, my maintenance box is also almost full. Um, I run it like this until it runs out. I have never really seen um, a reduction of print quality due to low ink cartridges. Um, I've had some people that have had some weird things where the printer is sitting for a long time and maybe switching out an ink cartridge has helped things, but I run these things till they're out. And when it says it's out, that's when I replace them. If you replace them before uh, they run out, you're just wasting ink and ink isn't cheap. Okay, so um, so this is how I've used it as a standalone application. You notice I drag and dropped images into it. So I'm gonna get out of it and I'm gonna go into Photoshop now. So I have these three images here as well. And, but you're gonna notice I go to go, uh, I go to file and automate. I've got a number of plugins here, Canon Professional Print and Layout and uh, Here's Epson Print Layout. So when you install the program, it does install the plugin for Photoshop. And you can go here to Epson Print Layout and it will take your file and export it to Epson Print Layout. It's one at a time though. Doesn't take all the images, it only takes the one image. 
So that's one of the other reasons why I like to use it as a standalone application. Um, uh, and um, I didn't show you, but I should. Sometimes I go a little fast to, you know, quit Epson print layout, just push the little red button, or you can go up here to file. Uh, nope. You, uh, yeah, you can go up here to Epson print lay layout and quit Epson print layout. So um, again, automate Epson print layout, send your file to Epson print layout, and uh, it'll bring back the last settings that you used, which is kind of nice. So it's all sticky until you change it. Um, and here's our print. Ta da we got a print. Yay, we did it. Okay, so that's how you use it in Photoshop. And um, and when you're in, so it looks like when you're using it as a plugin, you can go back to Photoshop. I'm not sure that if you make changes, they're going to show up here, though. So I would recommend before you like make adjustments to the file, close out of Epson Print Layout first. Um, and then we have Lightroom. So here's Lightroom. Um, Lightroom works a little differently. So um, so we can go to export here in Lightroom. And up on top, you know, this is usually, you know, you can you can choose a number of different, like you can export to your hard drive and such. So, but there is an export to Epson print layout here. And um, for those of you who do print out of Lightroom, I'm going to give you a kind of a tip here. Don't print out Lightroom. <laughs> and the reason is this. Lightroom doesn't handle things very specific, a couple of things very specifically. It doesn't handle color space very specifically. doesn't handle size. So if I export this to just to export it to Epson print layout, and if I'm printing it in uh, Lightroom as well, there's some weird things that happen here. So this image is 534 PPI, right? It's not 360. So it didn't resize it, right? It's it's a higher pixel density now. And honestly, I don't even really know what color space it is. I don't know if it's Adobe RGB 1998 or Profoto RGB or sRGB. <coughs> Sorry, got to take a drink of water. I actually have an inquiry into Epson as to what is this file now? I can't tell. So I have a certain lack of control. And this also happens when you're printing out of Lightroom. I find, I've done a lot of testing. I always get my re best results exporting out of Lightroom and either bringing it into Photoshop or printing from my exported file. So this did export it directly to Epson print layout. Um, but I also have this set up, export with preset, EPL 10 inch on the long side. And what I did was um, I set up a custom preset where I am exporting it to a folder. It is a TIFF file at Adobe RGB 1998, 16 bit at 10 inches on the long side at 360 PPI, and it will open in another application. Okay, I have set all of that up. So now when I export it, it comes into Epson print layout and it is at 360 PPI at the size that I want, right? So that's how I do it because I want to have that control. If you're going to do export to EPL and that works for you and that's simple, do that. Right, but this is how I do it, just to make sure that all my parameters are solid. So, oh, we got through it. Ta -da. Um, okay, so do we have, I can't see the chat any, oh, there, let's see, there's some stuff in the chat. Is there anything in the chat? Um, okay, so, um, Okay, Judy. Uh, okay, so Judy, positive, um, positive words on uh, what she's calling the psycho session. So, um, 
Yes, Judy, we did that uh, earlier in the year, and uh, she had some work that she was, you know, not quite sure what paper she wanted, and we did that, and she was able to move forward with some really um, solid paper choices. We did it with Andy as well. Uh, Richard has asked the question, is there anything that Epson print layout can do that cannot be done in the print dialogue of Lightroom Classic? Um, uh, so the print dialog in Lightroom Classic to me is very complicated. Um, it's a printing module, right? It's a printing module. If you want to continue using it, great. I find this to be much simpler because everything's in one column. It's in one program, in one column. It's all laid out in the order of the things you want to be able, you, you need to choose. Um, it's just an alternative to the, the printing module in Lightroom. You don't have to use this. Just saying that, you know, when I set people up to print and we use this program, uh, their eyes aren't glazing over like they do in, in the Lightroom print module or in Photoshop, because you got to go to a lot of different windows. So it isn't really doing anything. You, you can't, you know, it isn't doing anything extra, but it is more um, organized. Um, okay, we're getting a lot of questions now. Uh, can you do all this with the P800? Yes, you can do it with the P800. Uh, the only caveat I'm going to say is that because I don't have a P800, um, the I uh, and I I've been trying I've been working with people who have P800s. Um, I'm not sure you can get this version of the software onto your computer with the P800. I think that with the P800. It's limiting it to the previous version of software, which has a couple of bugs in it. Um, also, it's worthy of noting that after you're done downloading and installing all the software, it will download a, a piece of software called the Epson Software Updater. And I guarantee that when you activate it, what it, it it's going to come up and tell you that there's a new version of the software updater because um, it's been happening every time. So you double click on it. It's going to download and install a new version of the updater. Then what it does is it searches Epson's uh, website um, and their server for new versions of the software for your printer, including firmware updates. So um, uh, uh, I find that Epson is really good about letting you know when there's new software available. And as soon as you get a new computer or even on your old computer, download that package. And, uh, and it does it in the background as well. It'll from time to time tell you when there's new software available, but go ahead, run the software updater and see what happens. But yes, you can use this software. You just may not be able to use this latest version. And it's really this stuff under the detailed settings that's changed. Um, so give it a shot. Um, I know this is EPL, but what are the pros and cons of using EPL versus Lightroom Classic? Like I said, this is just a easier, more organized, more orderly and laid out um, printing module. There's no, not necessarily any advantage to it other than, like I said, when you print out of Lightroom directly, you don't have really a lot of control over color space and size and its relationship to PPI. So I always export out of Lightroom anyway, but it's totally up to you. You don't have to do this. I wanna make you happy. If this does not make you happy, go away. <laughs> okay, I print um, from Photoshop. What changes with this software from what is available in my Photoshop print layout? Again, it's the same thing. It's But in Photoshop, you gotta go to print, then you got to go to that first screen. You got to make some changes there. Then you go into page setup and then you go into changes there. Again, this is just a more orderly and more organized, simpler to use interface than what Photoshop has in, in the operating system uh, file and print command. Um, Jackie, yes, psycho sessions are a must. You're right. You're true. That That is very true. Um, uh, and she's even commented that she fought Epson print layout to begin with, but once she got used to it, she's a believer. So, 
Um, and this is just the same with everything. Um, I realize that people get uh, comfortable with a certain workflow. And if it works for you, great. But it's just like a car to me. People people complain all the time. Well, there's something new to learn, and eh. you know, you know what? You get a new car. I got a I got a new car about a year and a half ago. I'm still learning what all the buttons do. You know, I'm still learning that car. Um, you know, and it's different from the car that I had prior. It, it it's four wheels and a steering. You know, four tires and a steering wheel, but it is different. And it's just like with anything. Uh, the more you use it, the more comfortable you get with it, and um, and like I said, I find that it solves when I have people that come to me and say, I find either Lightroom or Photoshop's print command is confusing and I switch them to this, they they get it. It's just more comfortable. But that's why we have different ways of doing different things. So, um, so um, Ella is asking, do we, am I offering the psychotherapy class anytime soon? So the psych, inkjet paper psychotherapy classes are one-on-one. -on -one. It basically consider it a mentoring session. Um, they are, uh, uh, if you're not local, I do them remotely. Um, and I will put a, um, uh, so here's our website and you basically order it. It's $99. I'll put a link in the uh, chat if I can get back to it, get back to the chat here. Um, so this is one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and I, I think it's important to make sure they're one-on-one -on -one because this is about helping you individually make choices about paper for yourself. Okay. Um, the the bigger conversation where you know I'm offering classes and such are either through LACP or other nonprofit photographic organizations, um, which is a a bigger conversation that I have called the world of inkjet paper, the print matters, where I talk about paper in its entirety as a major uh, topic of conversation. But these this is one on one. Um, so, and it, it, it is at a mutually convenient time for both of us. So you would place your order and then I will get notified from our web staff um, that you placed an order and then we will, um, um, we'll schedule a time that's mutually convenient and we'll do it. And then you'll send me some files and we're gonna choose eight papers from all of the hundreds of papers we have to choose from. Um, and I will uh, print images on, if you have an Epson printer, that's why I have an Epson P900 printer here. If you have a Canon printer, I'll print it on uh, my Canon printer. I have a Pro 1000 here. And what you don't see to the right of me is a Canon 44 inch printer, uh, Canon Pro 4100. Um, so let's see, uh, got a number of, okay, we got a whole bunch of, i to expand these. Okay. Um, um, whoops, you said you can download a driver, but it isn't the same as for the 900. Um, so Ellen Stone, I don't understand that question. You can unmute yourself if you'd like. Ellen? Because the first part of it was, I asked if it, you can use it with the P800, and then I, then you, uh, anyhow, you already answered the question, so it's okay. <laughs> so yeah, it's just a different driver. You just go to the P800 driver right. page and download the driver for that. Yeah. Well, since okay. I'm on here, I want to ask you, do you think it's worth it to get the, the new P900? Or should um, I stay with my you're, you're not going to um well let me put it this way it you're not going to you're not going to see an improvement in print quality i think that the print quality on all of these printers has gotten to a certain level they're not working on print quality anymore they're working on speed they're working on convenience so the p900 uh is a printer that i can now wholeheartedly recommend i was never a big fan of the mm. p800 and the reason was that you know, you're switching between photo black and matte black and it print the printer literally switches, right? It's got a purge 
one of the black inks and replace it with the other. And I'm printing on so many different papers all the time. That would be a huge waste of time and money, especially when I'm doing a workshop. And the reason that that, that process had to occur was because there's only one channel for black ink. And if those two inks touch, they turn into a corrosive liquid. It's just the way they made their printers up to that point. So the P900 allows you to switch between photo black and matte black, but it doesn't physically switch. It just prints the ink you want. I shouldn't even use the word switch. So that was a major improvement to me, especially if you're printing on a lot of different papers. It's just more economical from a time and money standpoint. The second thing I like about the P900 is that you can feed all your paper from the top. Yeah as opposed to the P800 where you got to use that wonky tray. You still have the wonky tray if you want to use it, but the reality is that you don't have to. You can feed everything the, from the top. Um, on all of these desktop printers, you know, over time, it starts going ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk. You got to feed it in there. Um, uh, I have some rubbing alcohol and a paper towel all the time, and I'll clean the little rubber roll. You know, there's a little rubber foot that comes up. You know, I'll, I'll send a print job, have the printer and you know, have that little foot come up and I'll saturate it with rubbing alcohol. That kind of clears that up. That just happens over time because paper's dusty. But to me, um, the P900 is smaller. It's like 30% smaller. It's lighter and it does a great job. But is mm -hmm. are you going to see an improvement in print quality? No, but there are a lot of conveniences to it. Right. So I can, like I said, I can wholeheartedly recommend the P900, whereas the P800, I'm like, uh, yeah, I just, I just didn't like all those things. Right. So, okay, let's see. Uh, to add to my comment, I used the P7000 and P600. Uh, oh, so that was, that was Linda. So yes, you can use this software with both of those printers. Uh, can you set a template? Uh, Andrew saying, can you set an, a, a template in EPL to do test strips for say five different temp settings. Um, good question. I don't remember seeing uh, there was like a you know what we call the old Kodak roundabout. I know Canon in their program no, has like a print Eric, pattern setting. Eric, let me let me just clarify. So I'm taking a printing class. There's not uh, it's a printer agnostic. And uh, one of the things she's talking about here in Boston, one of the things she's talking about is um, making a test strip. So you, you get the image to where you think it should be. And then you, you move the temperature slider to cooler or warmer by a certain degree until you can see a difference. And then you multiply that difference for five different images. Then you put those on a test strip, you know, and print that. Uh, and then you can see what it looks like on paper in addition to what it looks like. So. I think, you know, when you showed the EPL, you showed different templates that they had. The question is, could you have one, each one of those five images in one of those slots in a five column uh, template? Um, here, I just here, stop here, sharing. Here, I don't know if you can see this, but. Yeah, I see. Yeah, you could do, you can do custom templates like that. Yeah. Okay. You could just, you could set up a couple, you just tell how many strips you want and what size right. are and. You could do, you know, that would be like one column by five rows or whatever. You right. Could yeah, exactly. Okay. That's yeah, I want to, I was tired of just looking at my computer screen. I wanted to see some people. So I stopped sharing. <laughs> um, okay. Let's go back to the chat here. Um, so, and by the way, Andrew, uh, I, you know, I try to tell, I try not to be judgmental with people. Um, you know, that, uh, what she's having you do. I think it's okay when you're starting off, but to me, you know, if you've got a monitor that is in fact appropriate for editing images and is calibrated, yeah. within ninety percent, what comes out of that printer should look like the monitor. Yeah, and the and whole it test strip thing to me is just such a throwback to the darkroom. Right. You know, and we have so much more control over this process that if it makes if the teacher's making you do it and it makes you comfortable, do it. And I know many famous photographers that print like the same image, eight and a half by 11, and make micro movements and document them and then put them up. And then 
And I'm like, okay, it's got to look good somewhere, right? To me, it's yeah. got to look good right back here compared to right. my monitor. Well, what happens when it goes to a gallery? What happens when it goes to somebody's house? The light's going to change, which means all that's kind of thrown out the window anyway, right? right. Yeah. I mean, the whole point to me of teaching digital fine art printmaking is to give you a level of predictability and right and you can only have that where you are right, right. once it goes out into the world it's like the wild west you know who knows what's going to happen in fact i have a great story where i was at a trade show once and we were making prints um at the trade show convention right for display in the booth we didn't want to print them and then risk getting them damaged and they were coming out of the printer and, and the artist was looking at him going, so Mr. Color Management, why are they so green? You know, and they were green because the color temperature and the bulbs in that convention center were like 3,200 K. They were horrible. Right. right. So I took a strip. I had my GTI viewing station, put it in the viewing station. It was perfect. Right. So I knew that I had to make an adjustment in Lightroom or Photoshop to compensate for the color temperature in the convention center the next yeah. print was perfect right but right. then if i brought in bright sunlight it didn't look very good right, right. <laughs> so right. so making adjustments for where the print's actually going to be hanging no okay so we got a bunch point, of more point questions taken. here oh, sorry go ahead no point taken um so tom asked when i upgraded from an intel mac to m1 mac uh epl would never work again Ticket with X, Epson never went anywhere. Anyone observe this? So um, you should contact me offline. Um, uh, for me, I have all M1 Macs and it works. Uh, not sure what's going on there, but I would be very interested to see because it did seem to be have M1 native code in it and um, and it worked really well. So I like to kind of investigate what's going on there. I have kind of direct contact with technical people at Epson that um, can hopefully give me an answer uh, rather than you know what you might get on the Epson service desk. I hate to say this, but could get a good person, maybe not get a good person. Great, I'll do that. Thank you. I appreciate it. You know, especially <laughs> this air print thing. Good luck trying to get a, a, a straight answer from Epson or Canon on it. I mean, I get calls from it all the time and they're like, well, why don't they know this? I'm like, I've told somebody, I've told people that are supposed to be filtering us down to them, but it, it just doesn't get there. So we'll have to do that okay. offline. I'll, I'll drop you a note. Thank you. Okay. Um, so let's see. Um, uh, can you talk about how you save, store, print image and my workflow? So uh, yeah, um, I kind of talked about it earlier. I don't want to, we're, we're at 11.33. Um, got a few more questions. So essentially um, what I do is I start, you know, I'm, if I'm shooting with a digital camera, um, you know, I'm shooting raw and then I'm processing it in Lightroom. Um, I have not experimented that much with Capture One. You know what? Every year I buy a license and I just never seem to get back to using it. <laughs> uh, uh, but this year, I think I'm going to I'm going to make a concerted effort because I'm going to start shooting more film. I got a couple of film cameras. I'm going to start shooting film um, and, you know, I'm going to be digitizing those negatives and slides using my DSLR camera. So I hear Capture One has some great tethering features. So I have a feeling we're gonna be using it a bit more this year. Uh, but in any event, so I usually start off in Lightroom um, and then I'm doing my global edits and then I will export that file, uh, you know, as a full size TIFF file, whatever the native file size is. I'll export that to a folder, save that, uh, oh, and then I'll I'll go to Photoshop. And then I start doing my pixel level adjustments, like when I want to remove something small or whatever. Um, and then I'll do my sharpening. I don't do sharpening in Lightroom. I do my sharpening in Nick Sharpener Pro, um, just what I've always been comfortable using. I'm not saying one's better than the other, but 
I use Nick Sharpener Pro. Um, if I'm doing black and white, I'll do my black and white conversion using Nick uh, Silver Effects Pro. And then, you know, if I'm going to enlarge the image, I use Topaz Gigapixel AI. I do very simple stuff. I'm not the Photoshop and Lightroom expert. I'm the how to get ink on paper um, expert, right? So, you know, there's a lot of other people who teach Photoshop and Lightroom and a lot of resources at LACP for that. So I generally refer people to, um, to those resources, but um, I do very simple stuff. You know, I'm not, I'm not a big layers guy. I'm not doing a lot of masking. I really believe in shooting it right, getting it right in camera. I print what I, you know, I, I shoot what I see, I print what I saw. You know, that's that's kind of my philosophy. I kind of keep it simple that way. Um, so is it worth scheduling an individual session if you have a 3880? Sure. Yeah. I mean, to me, um, if you have a oh, sorry, I have um I skipped one. I have a 3080 EPL 1.5.5. Are there any material difference in setup and use? Um, I don't think uh EPL is gonna work with a 3880. I haven't tried it but it's not designed to work with that printer. It's designed to work with the next printer, uh, next generation printer, which was the P800 on up. You could try it, but I don't know if it's going to work. Okay. Um, I don't think it will. Um, it's worse. So, um, but if you have a 3880, um, you know, and you need help uh, by all means, I am, uh, my philosophy on printers is if you have a working printer, um, let's keep it working. That printer is an old printer now. Um, it's no longer really supported. They don't last forever. Um, if you have a 3880, it seems like it's lasted forever. Um, for every customer or person that I've run into that says, I have an Epson 3880, I've had it for 12 years. It's running like a champ. I've got you know 20 other people that had to buy three printers in the same time period. These <laughs> printers do not last forever. It's digital world. It's not like the old days where you buy a camera and it's good for 30 years. You might have to get it repaired once in a while. <laughs> it, this stuff is not designed to be repaired. Do not get attached to it. Okay. When it breaks, let it go. Get another one. It's not worth it. It's just, in fact, um, if your printer breaks under warranty, uh, they come with a full year warranty. You could buy extended warranties for them as well. Some people have. I, I find it pretty reliable though. Every once in a while, I get somebody that after two years gets a fatal error or some sort of problem. Um, and you can kind of buy warranties. I think they're like a $99 a year and stack them up, you know, over up to like four years. But, um, um, you know, every once in a while, I get somebody that's got a problem, you know, sooner than four years. But uh, every printer I've ever seen, they're all going to break at some point. And then the other thing is the operating system. It gets to the point where you can't run the software anymore. Your computer gets updated. This is digital world. They're really good at research and development and planned obsolescence. We're going to make sure that at some point that, you know, this here is not going to fit into whatever slot you had, right? So, so, you know, these are, these are our digital, this is our digital world now. It's, you know, they want you to buy a new thing every, every, every so often. You don't make any money if you just keep on using the same equipment and keep it running. But if you've got a working 3880, by all means, let's keep it running. And if you need help, um, we also have, you know, on our website, um, you know, an item called uh, tech support. I have people that, um, look, quick questions, send me an email, you know, I'm really good at that. You know, if we need to spend like hours together, we do have a, um, um, you know, a an item on our website. It's called one hour tech support, $99. I have people that um, they get printers and uh, all over the world, you know, in Asia or uh, Africa or Middle East. Uh, I've got, you know, uh, in Europe, got customers all over the world who buy, you know, large format printers. My real expertise is, is in the, Canon and Epson large format printers at 24 inch and larger. They get them and they're like, what do I do with this thing? And then they find about out about me through the internet. And, and um, you yeah, know, we charge $99 an hour and sometimes they'll, you know, be four or five hours and they're happy because now they know how to use their printer. You know, they've been trained. Uh, this, like I said, you know, in the beginning, none of this stuff is easy to use. It's not intuitive. 
Um, printers do not anticipate your needs. They do not think for you. They're big, dumb toasters. And when you make a print and you go, why didn't that work? It's, it's really because you chose something wrong. You chose something poorly, usually because of lack of knowledge, right? Or, or you just made a mistake. I still put paper in upside down sometimes. It happens, you know? And then, you know, especially if it's a resin coated paper, it looks like a Van Gogh painting and the ink never dries, you know? You go, what did I do? Well, you know, you, you know that happens sometimes. So, but uh, yes, um, quick questions via email. Not a problem. I, I also tell people that, you know, like right now, my phone's ringing. I'm getting texts and emails. I'm not answering it, right? I mean, I never get done with, with a class. So if I'm with, if I'm working with you, um, I kind of put the blinders on. So just, um, I try to get back to people as fast as possible. So I just tell people, if I don't get back to you right away, I will get back to you as soon as I possibly can. And it's because I'm I'm working with somebody. I want to be respectful of your time, and I'm um, I'm I'm very easily distracted. So um, I'm kind of like a dog that sees a squirrel. I go, you know, and then I go over the, you know, and I, I just I try to avoid that. I want to give everybody the same respect and laser like attention and focus. Um, do you have a recommendation for a good monitor? Uh, so Linda, yes. Um, so uh, we're not a consumer electronics company. So we have focused as a company on the brand BenQ, B-E-N-Q. And we only sell the range of monitors that are, it's called SW, don't know what it means, but it's the monitors that are uh, designed specifically for photographers who want to edit still images for printing. They're not the designer series, which is P3 color space um, without a hood. They're, they're, you know, they're not the inexpensive little $200 monitors. These monitors um, for a 27 inch monitor start at $799, comes with a viewing shade. It's a flat mat display with 98% um, or 99% Adobe RGB 1998, and it can be calibrated with an X-Rite or data color, although we sell, or sorry, uh, Calibrite. We sell Calibrite um, uh, monitor calibration devices. Um, it can be software calibrated with the calibration uh, devices, uh, CC profiler software, or you can use BenQ Palette Master and do hardware calibration. So it's a very high quality monitor that is to me very much equivalent to an ISO or a NEC monitor, which are much more expensive brands. And when people ask me, what's the difference? I go, well, the other ones are more expensive. Um, if you wanna get a more expensive monitor, get them. Um, the ISOs do have built-in calibration devices, which people find are convenient, but then again, you can only calibrate that monitor. That's why I like the separate calibration device because you can put it on any monitor, but, um, but um, uh, we don't carry any or ISO. I just find that our customers want the best quality product for the best value. And BenQ represents that for us. Um, uh, but any of those brands are great. I have not necessarily been impressed with the product offering from Dell or AG, LG or Asus. Um, there's no real need for a 4K monitor for doing this. If you want 4K, BenQ also has some options for that. They also have a 31 and a half inch 4K monitor. Um, but um, but our brand is BenQ. So okay. I, I use a BenQ, but it's Good. an older BenQ. Um, been quite happy with it, but I know at some point I'm probably going to have to replace it. Well, you know, BenQ so. monitors they come with a uh, with a three year warranty. Um, almost every, I've only had a couple of people that, you know, after like five years finally died, you know, yeah, I've um, had my close to five years, you know, but you know, it's like I said, it's digital. It's, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, you know, it's designed to be replaced. So at mm -hmm. some point, you know, there are newer models, um, and also any of the newer models that have a C at the end of them, uh, it means it has a USB C cable that cable powers your laptop. It's actually a powered cable. It handles a video signal. There's a little um, 
uh, hub on the left-hand side of the monitor, the rear, that has two more USB 3.0 ports and an SD card slot. And that one cable kind of handles everything, you know? So, um, you know, and it also is the higher quality connection as opposed to HDMI. A lot of people say, oh, I'll just plug in via HDMI. Well, HDMI is a lower bandwidth connection and it can clip your shadows and your highlights. So okay. the USB-C or display port to mini display port, those other video connections are, are a bit more appropriate for what we're doing uh, okay. for editing still images for printing. HDMI is a television standard. Yeah. So. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. You can make them a good calibration device. So Ellen, yes, the uh, Calibrite um, Color Checker Display Pro is the uh, device that I recommend. And I can... Um, uh, I can put a link in the chat for that. Um, uh, so there's a plus and where's the, where is it? Um, oh, I see. It'd help if I spelled it correctly. So there's two devices. There's a plus and a pro. The pro is $279, the plus is $319. Um, I don't see the purpose for most people to get the plus. It's a little more sensitive sensor, but it's really designed for monitors that are have a brightness level up to 2000 nits. All of our monitors that we're using are really up to you know, no more than 500 nits. So the Pro is the more appropriate device. And when we're calibrating them, and uh, we're really setting them for 120 nits. So um, the plus, I have some people who just say, I want the better product, they get it. Um, but the pro is really the more popular product. And it right now is coming with a, um, a, a color checker mini um, uh, free in the package. So it's a really good value. Um, and then also when you buy it from Freestyle, you get along with it, a um it's a 27 page um uh instruction manual step by step instruction manual written by me okay it's a hard copy and it's not like little lines of type it's screenshots with big circles that say plug it in push this button go to the next page it's really step by step and i've written it and rewritten it over the years to ensure that if you have no idea how to calibrate a monitor, that you will be successful calibrating your monitor. And at the bottom, if you really get into trouble and you're stuck, you get to call me. You get to send me an email and I will get on and do whatever it takes to make sure that your monitor is calibrated and you understand how to do it. And you, I will not let you fail. That is my commitment to every single customer or student of mine is, I will not let you fail. You will, at the end of it, you will have an under, you'll at least be able to do it. You may not understand it, but at least you'll know how to do it. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, so the EPL media setting for Barita paper should still be an ultra premium luster as opposed to Barita. There really isn't, in many of those media settings, and I, I hate to get into this, but a lot of them are basically the same. They just call it Barita because there's an Epson Barita. You can certainly use it with ultra premium photo paper luster, but the profile, which handles color, is different. So if you go to Canson um, Infinity's website um, and you look at their recommended media settings for their Barita paper, for instance, it'll say, you know, ultra premium photo paper luster, or it'll say premium semi gloss. You know, usually it, the manufacturers focus on ultra premium photo paper luster. Um, it, there's really no difference in the media setting between those, but the profile could be different. Um, I hate to say it, but some of the profiles are the same. I just like got to kind of keep it even, right? So if you're using an Epson paper, I'm just telling you, use whatever the media setting is for the paper, right? When you deviate, then go to the manufacturer's website like Canson or Hanamuli, Look at their PDF files, look at their documentation and make sure you choose 
that appropriate media setting that they've recommended, right? And for me, like I said, in general, if you're using the ultra premium photo paper luster media setting, you're going to be fine on all glossy and luster paper, right? It's when you start getting results and you go, eh, then you're calling me going, what am I doing wrong? And then we've got to solve it. We've got to go through that list and see what you've chosen poorly, right? So it's combination media type setting and profile. Media type setting, mechanical instructions to how to squirt ink on paper, color, the profile is color, right? That's what it is, it's color. That's what it controls. Uh, what do I think of the new iMac screen, screens? Um, iMac screens are good for normal people. They're not really good for us. Uh, Apple monitors, all Apple monitors, even the $7,000 monitor or the $1,600 monitor, Apple is not making monitors for us. They're making monitors for the general public that wants images to look really pretty and really flattering. They're glossy. They're high contrast. They are um, very saturated. They're designed primarily for the part of the market, which is the majority of the market, that wants to view, you know, movies streaming on iTunes. That's what they're designed for. They're everything that Apple is creating um, in the market is designed around video. So your monitor, um, your iMac monitor, or any of the Apple monitors, they're all P3 color space, which is a different color space than we're using. We're using Adobe RGB 1998. And they're different. It's still wide gamut, but they're not the same. They're two different color spaces. There are colors you might see on your Apple monitor. You're never going to be able to print, right? So um, I find that iMacs um, are great for an all-in-one computer, but they're not really good for editing still images for printing. So I still very much recommend getting a BenQ monitor, and you can plug it into the Thunderbolt port and use that for your image editing if you have the desk space. Um, otherwise, I really, I mean, what I'm using now is I have an M1 Mac mini and I've got two BenQ monitors plugged into it. I have my camera, camera in the middle, which is why I'm looking over here because this is where you are. Um, uh, and it does everything I want it to do. So I have two 27 inch BenQ monitors here that are calibrated, um, you know, but, you know, we all have to make choices based on our desk space and uh, what's comfortable for us to use. I love using two monitors because I can have you all here. I can have my website and all this stuff here. It's got, I have like literally this much of desk space, right? Okay. And um, so it's convenient. But um, uh, I think iMac monitors for the, you know, 99% of the population that isn't printing their work, they're beautiful. For us, we need something a bit more accurate and appropriate. Um, what I see off of my BenQ monitor more will more match what's coming out of my printer than an, than an iMac or any of the Apple displays. And believe me, I've been there with professional photographers and I've been there with uh, commercial labs and, 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 and just people all over the, you know, the full range of the photo industry. And whenever we're looking at a, an iMac or an Apple monitor, we're kind of disappointed with the print because it doesn't look like that. And it's not ever going to look like that. It's not, and, and the reason it's not designed for it. So, and all Apple computers now, think about it. Every time they're comparing to specs, it's against a video editing rig, right? They're, it's everything on these M1 and M2 chips is about how fast it is against a, a computer that edits 8K, you know, 3D, 3D video. So they're screaming computers. They're great computers. Monitors, beautiful, but not really appropriate for editing images for still, you know, editing still images for printing. Um, and uh, somebody, Bruce said, thank you so much. Sorry, I have to go. This was super informational. Yay. Okay, we made it. I can't believe it. I'm early. I'm never early. Do we have any more questions? No. Oh, Jim, he's got his hand up, I think. Do you have your hand up, Jim? Or are you just like raising? Eric, I just wanted to tell everyone if they haven't uh, calibrated their monitor, 
that uh, you know I purchased your your uh, BenQ and the uh, calibration device, and honestly, the book that you've written that you provided with that calibration device is worth the money alone. Yay. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, it made it so bulletproof, and I was able to dead on get my BenQ and my MacBook Pro which I'm feeding it from, uh, dead spot on in, in color. And uh, and when I compared the instruction book that came from the monitor company to yours, there was just no comparison. Well, you know, <laughs> so the, we really again, appreciate the, that. Yeah, again, these things are written written and made by engineers for engineers. They're, you know, they're providing you with something, but uh, you know, I, I wish I had a better answer as to why there isn't a higher level of education out there. I mean, I deal with colleges and universities and, and I don't know if it's just too hard. I don't know if people, you know, what, you know, um, I just don't know, you know, but I'm, you know, like I said, I'm here to help. Um, and, you know, I, I always also like to let people know that I wasn't born like this. I mean, I just wasn't immaculately conceived with... <laughs> a solid understanding of this. I mean, I've had to learn it. And, you know, and in my position working for, you know, one of the, you know, premier, you know, companies in the industry that sell this stuff, I have access to people that you don't, right? I mean, I give direct access. So when there's a problem, you know, there's somebody I can get my, I can get my hands wrapped around their neck and squeeze until I get an answer. Sometimes there isn't an answer, but at least I'm getting to a top level person who can tell me really what's going on. And I've also surrounded myself with people that can help me. I didn't do this on my own. A lot of people have contributed to my success. A lot of people have um, you know, said, hey, I hear you talk about it this way, but what about this? And you don't really talk about it. You know? So I've incorporated a lot of this into the conversation over a very long period of time. And, you know, I'm not somebody that sits around going, I, I know everything. I don't. I'm always learning. Um, I have a thirst for knowledge and and I love sharing that with people. So. So. Um, so anyway, I don't know. What do you think, Jason? We good for a thank you. Are you still there, Jason? Are you awake? Yes, I'm, there he is. I'm, I'm here. <laughs> I'm very awake. <laughs> so, lots um, of coffee so and I, lots of work. So for those of you who are local, we do have an LACP print lab that um, is located at Contact Photo Lab um, in the brewery downtown. Uh, we set that situation up so that for people who don't have uh, access to a large format printer, uh, they have access. Um, it's open Thursday from 10 to 4, which is when Jason's there. It's also open on Sundays from 10 to 2, which is when Matthew Finley's there. We have a 24 inch in can, uh, 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 two Canon printers. One's a 24 inch, one's a 44 inch. Um, and you bring your own paper. We charge by the hour. Um, and there's a LACP member friendlier hourly rate as opposed to a non-member rate. Um, and it's by appointment. And we have uh, M1 Mac minis with calibrated BenQ monitors. Um, I go in there once a month, the first Thursday of every month, and do a two-hour printing training class, which you will have to take in order to uh, learn how to use the printer so you're not spending your first day in there trying to learn how to put in paper and stuff. Uh, Jason or Matthew will be there to help you, but it is a different program. Um, Canon has their own program called Professional Print and Layout, but we do have the Print Lab, which is a very popular feature of LACP and then on their website um, if you search for me as an instructor you'll see all the upcoming classes that I will be teaching both in person and online so um, I also do teach a two-day uh, workshop called the fine art of digital printmaking um, which I believe is coming up again in February um, and um, uh, people fly in from all over the country generally to take that class um, and uh, we have a lot of fun. It's basically soup to nuts. You get to learn everything in two days, um, and we purposefully and strategically teach that on weekends so that it is convenient for people to fly in on a Friday night 
and leave out either on a Sunday afternoon or Monday morning. So, um, so anyway, uh, Jason, any parting, parting uh, words? Just thank you so much, Eric, uh, as always, for uh, your invaluable time and um, deep dive into your brain. And I want to thank everyone for attending. And again, if you're not a member, please do join and support us. You will get discounts uh, on things like being able to use the Print Lab at a uh, discounted rate. I did drop a link in there. Uh, that'll take you straight to the page with information about the print lab and there's also a scheduler program there that you can use to book time in the lab and i really do hope to see uh um, everyone that we can we love having people in that lab on thursdays and sundays for sure it's a it's a real blast in there so uh other than that uh enjoy the rest of your day make work make good work make bad work just make work and uh, get to printing it's important